In this session, we're going to move on from our studies of the particle in boxes to think about what happens when particles start to rotate. By way of a quick recap, it's worth you spending some time to just revisit the previous concepts. Write down what happens to the number of modes as we increase the quantum number for the particle in a box. Make sure that you can explain how we know the value of the normalization constant for the particle in the box. And make sure you're able to explain the occurrence of degeneracy in the 2D box, with particular emphasis on the conditions which have to exist for degeneracy to occur. It's also worth you giving some thought to what other degenerate states might exist. In continuing the story of quantum mechanics, all the concepts that we need to complete this course are in place. We've talked about the wave function and what the wave function means in terms of the mathematics, but also the physical observables of the system. We also spoke about eigenfunctions and the fact that wave functions must be eigenfunctions of the Schrodinger equation. Remember, an eigenfunction is a function which simply returns itself when an operator acts on it. We spoke about the significance of operators, particularly in reference to the Schrodinger equation, and what effect these have on the wave function itself. And we also looked at the separation of variables, being able to consider two components, for example the x and the y component, separately. In this session we're going to look at how changing coordinates can simplify a problem that we want to look at. In particular we're going to be talking about the particle in a ring, the rotations of angular momentum, but we'll also move on later to talk about the quantum harmonic oscillator. When we think of the particle in a ring, we're thinking about circular motion. Fundamentally, what happens as a particle rotates around an origin? So this requires us to consider the Schrodinger equation in two dimensions. So a ring is in the xy plane, so we would need to consider the Schrodinger equation in the x dimension as well as the y dimension. However, the x and y components on the ring are not independent of each other. They vary with respect to each other in accordance with the laws of circular motion. The radius is constant and only the angle is varying. So this means we can find x and y in terms of the radius and the angle between them. If, if we look at the radius here, it's creating a right angle triangle with the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate. So this allows us to calculate x and y in terms of r and phi. It may help you to draw a right angle triangle, but what this allows us to do is to simplify it to a one-dimensional problem. We can convert our r and phi components to x and y components r is a constant and phi is the only variable. This allows us to simplify the Schrodinger equation where we're simply considering the second derivative of the wave function with respect to the angle of rotation. In effect this is a pseudo one-dimensional problem. Yes we're rotating in the two xy dimensions but the only variable we need to consider is the phi, the angle around which it rotates. So this makes the Schrodinger equation considerably simpler Looking at the mr squared component, we'll come back to this later, but this is quite an important thing to recognize that we have this mr squared instead of the mass here. What we need to do now is we now need to consider the boundary conditions, exactly what we thought about with the particle in the box. This time, however, we are rotating rather than moving along a box. So we're rotating from 0 to 2 pi, so that's a full rotation around the ring. Remember, we have the same restrictions. Psi must be single-valued and it must be continuous. So let's look at this ring in 3D space. Here we have a ring, we've defined a starting point, and this phi, this rotation, will go all the way around to 2 pi, where it meets up with itself again. In order for the wave function to be continuous, the wave function must be the same value when it comes round on itself again. So after a full rotation, phi must equal the same value again. It's got to be the same value at the start and the end of the rotation. What we're going to do, for the sake of simplicity, is rather than try and visualize this in three dimensions, we're going to take it down to two. So we're going to cut the ring here and we're going to unravel it. So now we're seeing the angle along the bottom here and the value of the wave function. So here we see we have a wave function that is single valued all the way around the ring. It is indeed the same value at the start and the end, but is this a valid wave function? Well, we need to consider other things as well. We have to consider the continuity we have to consider whether that wave function is continuous and whether its slope is continuous. This indeed does fit that requirement. The wave function is greater than zero throughout, giving us a finite probability of finding the particle on that ring, but it's important to recognize that particle-in-a-box solutions won't necessarily work. We don't have the same boundary conditions, as in we don't have the requirements to come back to zero at each point, but we do have the additional requirement that it must be the same value at the start and the end. Let's now look at the continuity of the wave function. We said that it's got to be the same value at the start and the end of the rotation. So let's look at this example here. So this would be the first wave function for the particle in a one-dimensional box, but let's consider it in the context of rotations. 
We look at it, it looks okay. But the problem is, of course, a half wavelength can't work. Remember, this is a wave function. Wherever it comes down to 2 pi, a full rotation here, we regime again from zero. It's continually rotating. If we shift our graph to look at a slightly different perspective, we see that as it comes down to its full rotation, it comes to a point and then goes off again like this. The problem is our slope here becomes discontinuous. The problem is much more visible when we visualize in three dimensions. So this is the same plot in three dimensions. We see that the wave function indeed goes up with a wave and then comes down to a point and we have this discontinuity in the slope of the wave function. We have broken one of the rules of wave function construction. So we can't have half wavelength. This means that our next level up must be a full wavelength of rotation. The other exceptions we need to consider. Well, we said it has to be the same value at the start and the end. The wave function cannot be zero, because if it's zero, we have a zero probability, therefore the particle can't exist. It has to be greater than zero somewhere. However, this blue line is absolutely allowable. We can have a constant wave function, but a wave function of equal to zero is not allowable at all. We also said that we have to have whole wavelengths. If we visualize this plot here, it looks slightly messy, but follow the trace of each of them. This first one is a full wavelength, and it will match up with itself when it goes round for a second cycle. This second one here, although it doesn't start at zero, it is still a full wavelength. It still matches up with itself when it comes around again. However, when we look at this middle one, this orange value here, it corresponds to three half wavelengths, and while the value might match up, it has the same discontinuity as we saw with the single half wavelength. So when we start to look at our wave functions, we can have a sine function. We can also have a cosine function. It is also allowable. It also matches up with itself. However, if we have a half wavelength, the sine 3 phi over 2, it's no longer allowable wave function because it has a half wavelength and it doesn't match up with itself on the second rotation. When we consider the general wave function for rotations, we have to consider the boundary conditions. So remember again, the wave function at a given value must be equal to the wave function when it comes around for its second cycle. Phrasing this more formally and more generally, if we say that at a general angle phi, the wave function must be equal to phi plus another full rotation. When we introduce our wave vector alpha, this is analogous to the k that we had in the particle in a box, we say that we've got to scale the angle phi or we scale phi plus two pi. This particular property of sine functions only works if alpha is an integer. So alpha becomes our quantum number ml. This is our angular momentum quantum number. Because it's an integer, this means that our rotations are also quantized. The curious thing is that we are now allowed to have negative values. ml can equal a negative value. We, this simply corresponds to an opposite rotation. Things can rotate forward, they can rotate backwards, and that corresponds to a flipping of the sign of the angular momentum quantum number. So let's start visualizing these cyclic wave functions. They can be quite tricky to visualize. We're fundamentally looking at a sine function based on our angle phi. So if we look at 2 here, where we have ml equals 0, corresponding to the blue line, and we have ml equals plus 1, which is equal to the purple line here. Okay, well if we imagine what would happen if we took this rectangle, cut it out and wrapped it round on itself, we would see a wave function that looks a little bit like this. So this is giving us an idea for what these wave functions look like in three-dimensional space. If we compare it to the ml as plus two, we end up with a three-dimensional shape that looks like this. This is the wave that's simply wrapping around a cylinder. This corresponds with the probability distribution of finding the particle at a given point on the ring. When we start to consider the energy levels in rotational systems, What's worth looking at in three dimensions is what happens to the nodes. Remember with the particle in a box, we had an increased number of nodes. So for n equals two, we had one node. For n equals five, we had four nodes and so on and so on. When we look at the particle in a ring, well, if we look at the sine wave, well, we can see we have a node at pi, but what's going on at two pi or zero? Well, looking at it here, we can see what's happening is we have a straight line going across our ring is a bit like a knife slicing a donut. It's providing us that node across that ring. And we can't establish a node at one point on the ring without having a node at the other side as well. And this is what we call an angular node. If we look at the 
second wave function, we have a node going across this way, but we also have a node going across the other way. This is what nodes look like when we start to consider rotations. And you've seen similar things in atomic orbitals. If you think of your p orbital, you have a node going across the middle of that. Thinking about energy levels in rotational systems, well, we apply exactly the same logic for particle in a box. We do the second derivative of the wave function, but this time it's going to look slightly different. The reason for this is because the mass is rotating. It's no longer a static mass that moves back and forward. It is a rotation. So the overall system has no kinetic energy, but the rotation carries angular momentum. So we need a different factor for the mass. And this factor that we use is something called the moment of inertia. This is simply a measure of an object's resistance to rotation. The more resistance it is to rotation, the higher its moment of inertia. So the bigger the radius, the greater the moment of inertia, the greater its resistance to rotations. And when we look at our Schrodinger equation, it simply becomes this factor here. We've changed the mass out for the moment of inertia, and we've changed x for phi. Otherwise, everything's exactly the same, and we apply the same logic. What we see is that we have a radial dependent on energy. The energy term will be over r squared, so the bigger the radius, the smaller the energy difference between each energy level. It's worth us giving some thought to the quantum number as well. So we said ml is the rotational quantum number, and remember we saw that we could have zero rotation. So when we have ml equals zero, this is an allowed value now because we can still have a non-zero wave function even though there is no wavelength to consider. So when ml is zero, we get no rotation. If ml is positive, we have rotation in one direction, but we can also have an equal energy when we get rotation in the opposite direction. And this is a result of the squared factor in the energy term. As we square the quantum number, we end up with one value and we lose track of the positive and negative signs. So we have distinctly different states of rotation in one direction versus the other direction, giving us degeneracy in our rotational energy levels. So this appearance of degeneracy is important when we start to consider our models in quantum mechanics. So if we visualize the energy levels of the rotations, we see that we have states of equivalent energy at ml is plus minus one, plus minus two, plus minus three, and so on. But because we have no rotation at ml equals zero, we don't have degeneracy in this first level. Remember, these are states of equivalent energy but opposite rotation. And this is how degeneracy is manifest in rotational systems. If we compare this to the one-dimensional box that we've seen before, in rotations we can have ml being zero, but all other levels are doubly degenerate, corresponding to this equal and opposite rotation. ml is one is distinct from ml is minus one. So this gives us different results. When we think of the 1D box, our wave function had integer half wavelengths, whereas in rotations we had integer full wavelengths. We also have no zero point energy in a rotation. Remember with the particle in a box, because of the requirement for n to equal 1, we would always have some energy. There's always some kinetic energy in that box, whereas in rotations we do have the option to have zero rotation. Fundamentally, the wave function does not have to have a zero value.